Big thanks to Professors Tartari and Foran for inviting me to participate in this online conference. Even bigger thanks to all of you who are participating in this online conference. Questions for the ages include what shall we do, what is worth doing, and was it worth it? The latter question is asked especially by those people who get to be about my age and older. As pointed out by Homer in the Iliad some 2,800 years ago, the, uh, the gods envy us. They envy us because we're mortal. The gods, on the other hand, are around forever. There's no need for them to stop and smell the roses. It's just another day. It's just another year. It's just another century in a life that lasts forever. For a more recent interpretation of this age-old question, what shall we do, what is worth doing, Carl Sagan points out in his September 28, 1980 book, quote, for small creatures such as we, the vastness is bearable only through love. It's not so much a question as a statement that life is short. We are insignificant from the perspective of the cosmos. And therefore, how do we act? How do we proceed? We are in the midst of abrupt, irreversible climate change on this planet. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, concluded climate change was abrupt in its October 8, 2018 report, Global Warming of 1.5 Degrees. Quote, these global level rates of human driven change far exceed the rates of change driven by geophysical or biosphere forces that have altered the Earth system trajectory in the past. The IPCC cites two peer reviewed papers in reaching this conclusion. Even abrupt geophysical events do not approach current rates of human driven change. In the IPCC's September 24, 2019 report, Special Report on the Ocean and Cryosphere in a Changing Climate, the IPCC concluded that climate change is irreversible, specifically pointing to an overheated ocean in reaching this conclusion. We know, of course, that the IPCC is conservative. Gerardo Perez and colleagues pointed out in the March 2019 issue of Bioscience with a paper titled Statistical Language Backs Conservatism in Climate Change Assessments. Quote, the tone of the IPCC's probabilistic language is remarkably conservative and emanates from the IPCC recommendations themselves, complexity of climate research, and exposure to politically motivated debates. In fact, the IPCC was designed to fail. As Professor Michael Oppenheimer pointed out on November 21st, 2007, in the Environmental Defense Fund blog titled How the IPCC Got Started, quote, the Reagan administration saw the creation of the IPCC as a way to prevent the activism stimulated by my colleagues and me from controlling the policy agenda. In other words, the IPCC was designed to fail. Mission accomplished. We are in the midst of abrupt, irreversible climate change. As pointed out by Andrew Y. Glickson, the famous professor in Australia, in his October 9, 2020 book titled The Event Horizon, quote, during the Anthropocene, greenhouse gas forcing has risen by more than 2.0 watts per meter squared, equivalent to more than 2 degrees C above pre-industrial temperatures, which constitutes an abrupt event over a period not much longer than a lifetime." End quote. Now, obviously, human animals, as with other organisms on the planet, require habitat to survive. As Linnea Hall and colleagues pointed out in the peer-reviewed Wildlife Society Bulletin in spring of 1997, quote, we therefore define habitat as the resources and conditions present in an area that produce occupancy, including survival and reproduction, by a given organism. Habitat is organism-specific. Habitat is the sum of the specific resources that are needed by organisms. Wherever an organism is provided by resources that allow it to survive, that is habitat. Well, as it turns out, Earth is rapidly losing habitat for humans. According to a paper by Raymond and colleagues published May 8, 2020 in Science Advances, the paper was titled The Emergence of Heat and Humidity Too Severe for Human Tolerance. People are dying already as a result of high wet bulb temperatures. 
How bad is it? According to Zhao and colleagues in a paper published July 1st, 2021, in the peer-reviewed Lancet Planetary Health, quote, global regional and national burden of mortality associated with non-optimal ambient temperatures from 2000 to 2019, a three-stage modeling study. That's the title. They conclude that more than 5 million people die each year due to what they call, quote, non-optimal ambient temperatures. How did we get here? Well, civilization is a heat engine. Civilization itself, no matter how it's powered, is a heat engine, as pointed out by Tim Garrett, a professor at the University of Utah, in his paper in the journal Climatic Change, titled, Are There Basic Physical Constraints on Future Anthropogenic Emissions of Carbon Dioxide? Four additional papers by Garrett, all peer-reviewed, provide details about how civilization itself is a heat engine. Now, what does the future of civilization hold on the current track, ignoring self-reinforcing feedback loops and the aerosol masking effect? Greenhouse gas emissions point us towards an Eocene-style climate as early as 2030. It's worse than that, of course. In light of decreased industrial activity, going what we generally think of as the right direction because we're reducing output of greenhouse gases, decreased industrial activity actually causes very rapid heating because of the loss of aerosol masking in the upper atmosphere. Aerosol, the aerosol masking effect, sometimes called global dimming, accounts for a 55% increase in overall planetary heating when we lose those particulates in the atmosphere. How quickly do they fall out of the atmosphere? According to James Hansen, in many of his presentations and Q&A following presentations, those particulates fall out of the atmosphere in about five days. Aerosol masking accounts for a 55 increase in overall planetary heating and 133% over land where most of us live. This according to a paper in the June, 20, June 15th, 2021 issue of Nature Communications. There are additional means by which we can cause our own extinction as well, as I pointed out in two peer-reviewed papers. One published in March 22, 2022 as, as part of the renowned Elsevier series, Results in Engineering. The paper was titled Environmental Thresholds for Mass Extinction Events, and it was written by myself and two European colleagues. An earlier paper from last year, 2021, published in Academia Letters, entitled Rapid Loss of Habitat for Homo Sapiens, indicates, again, additional means by which we are causing our own extinction. Particularly important is the rate of environmental change. It, in fact, is quite critical to the continued persistence of habitat for any species. A paper by, published by Strona and Bradshaw in the renowned Nature series in the journal called Scientific Reports, published November 13, 2018, is titled, Coextinctions Annihilate Planetary Life During Extreme Environmental Change. And here's the bottom line from the paper. Two quotes. In a simplified view, the idea of coextinction reduces to the obvious conclusion that a consumer cannot survive without its resources. Of course, that's obvious. And then finally, the quote that really defines this entire paper and its findings. A rogue, seemingly desert Earth wandering across the universe could still have some tiny chance of blooming again under some lucky and unlikely circumstances. End quote. Those are our odds at this point if we achieve 5 or 6 degrees Celsius above the 1750 baseline, and we're well on our way to that path. How important is the rate of change? Well, Professor James Anderson from Harvard University, now Professor Emeritus, was quoted in Forbes in the January 15, 2018 edition, quote, the chance there will be permanent ice in the Arctic after 2022 is essentially zero. So James Anderson was expecting an ice-free Arctic Ocean next year, 2023, with full impacts to be realized the following year, 2024. 
He was joined in this prediction by Professor Jennifer McKinnon some three years later. She is at the University of California, San Diego, and also has an appointment with the Scripps Institution. And she was interviewed by CBS News on April 23rd, 2022, in which she expects an ice-free Arctic Ocean in 2022, perhaps in 2023. The good news is that the Naval Postgraduate School six-month ensemble forecast released April 6th, 2022, that's a little over a month ago, finds that the first ice-free Arctic Ocean in history will not occur in late September of this year. Rather, we will end up with about four to five million square kilometers of ice floating in the Arctic Ocean. That's good news. The bad news is that a mass extinction event is well underway. Edward O. Wilson, in his book published in 1992 by Harvard University Press, entitled The Diversity of Life, concludes, quote, The sixth great extinction spasm of geological time is upon us, grace of mankind. And he also points out, quote, In the world as a whole, extinction rates are already hundreds or thousands of times higher than before the coming of man, they cannot be balanced by new evolution in any period of time that has meaning for the human race." End quote. In other words, a mass extinction event has been underway for more than 30 years. The United Nations Environment Program recognized that 150 to 200 species were being driven to extinction every day, that in their August 2010 report. Finally, the peer-reviewed literature caught up with reality with a paper published in the renowned Science Advances by Ceballos and colleagues on June 19, 2015. The paper is titled Accelerated Modern Human-Induced Species Losses Entering the Sixth Mass Extinction. Additional papers have been published by Ceballos and colleagues as well. As Gerardo Ceballos was quoted in Science Daily on June 19, 2015, quote, Life would take many millions of years to recover, and our species itself would likely disappear early on." End quote. Again, it appears that we are headed for the extinction of all life on Earth as a result of the very rapid rate of change triggered by loss of Arctic ice, and therefore the loss of aerosol masking. In addition, the extinction of all life on Earth would almost certainly occur as nuclear facilities melted down throughout the world. These many, many nuclear power facilities would therefore cause stripping away of stratospheric ozone and leading to very rapid sunburning and very rapid heating of the planet. It appears to me that we are not particularly interested as a species in retaining habitat for ourselves or other life on Earth. As pointed out by John Kenneth Galbraith on page 22 in his January 1st, 1977 book, The Age of Uncertainty, quote, people of privilege will always risk their complete destruction rather than surrender any material part of their advantage. They feel that their privileges, however egregious they may seem to others, are a solemn, basic, God-given right, end quote. So there we are. The people who might be able to help us retain habitat on this most wonderful of planets are probably not interested in doing so. I'll finish with a bit of good news. The number of atoms in the universe, and actually we have a pretty good idea of how many there are, there's about 10 to the 80th atoms in the universe. The odds against you appearing, of me appearing in physical form, are about 10 to the 2.685 million. In other words, the odds against any one of us appearing is more than 30,000 times greater than the odds against plucking a single atom from the universe at random. And yet, here we are. Back to the question of what shall we do and what is worth doing. I'm going to quote from a quote often attributed to Ralph Waldo Emerson, probably incorrectly. The purpose of life is not to be happy. It is to be useful, to be honorable, to be compassionate, to have it make some difference that you have lived and lived well. Again, frequently attributed to Ralph Waldo Emerson, probably incorrectly. And then the question many of us are asking at this 
moment in time in our lives as I scream past 60 years of age is asked by the cover and subsequently in the book by Doug Peacock, American writer, with his October 5th, 2021 book, Was It Worth It? Only you can answer that question. Only you can create a life for yourself that makes it worth it. Again, thank you for watching, for paying attention, for noticing what's going on in the world. I look forward to participating in this online conference to the maximum extent that I'm able.